Welcome back guys. I don't want to waste time with a fancy intro. Instead, I want to get back on the Audi and get back in the swing of making two episodes a week. So let's dive in and rip the engine out of this thing. It seems like a pretty common theme for YouTubers to start a project only to push it to the back burner and for it to never see any state of completion. But I promised you guys that once we had some breathing room on our Ferrari project, we'd return to the Audi to make some progress. And I'm happy to say that today is finally that day. So let's pull the cover back and figure out exactly where we left off on this thing. Some of you may remember that our last step was to put the car up onto jack stands and remove all of the suspension. These parts will be shipped off to Germany for a custom coilover build by our friends at H&R. But with the suspension off of the car, that leaves us to work on the engine. There were signs that we had a blown head gasket, but a leak down test confirmed it. So today we're gonna pull the original 2.1 liter engine out of the car. But for those that don't know, I am not an Audi guy and I have no idea how this car comes apart. So you guys are going along for the ride with me. Sure, I could look up a tutorial on how this engine comes out, but what better way to learn exactly how this car works? For no particular reason, I decided to get started on the passenger side of the engine bay. I figured if I could get the wiring and the fuel lines out of the way, I could get a better idea of what I'm working with by visuals alone. We could cut a lot of this stuff out, but I want to preserve it because parts for these cars are hard to find. We're not going to reuse any of it, but I guarantee there's a Quattro guy out there that would die for it. The first component that I'm actually removing from the car is the CIS fuel injection system. It's a form of mechanical fuel injection, and you can think of this part like a distributor for fuel. I assume you guys have figured it out already, but this is an antiquated system, so we are not gonna reuse it. Then comes the cast aluminum air box, one of the cooler parts I've seen in a long time. I worked my way across the engine bay, next to deciding to tackle the cooling system, which means, for better or worse, this is where the mess begins. And I don't care what you tell me, I'm not gonna believe you if you say you've managed to pull an engine without getting coolant all over your garage floor too. I pressurized the coolant cap to push a bit more coolant out of the block and then began removing the rest of the coolant hoses, including the hoses on the back of the engine for the heater core. I made it about an hour into disassembly when I realized we were facing one rather critical problem when it comes to pulling the engine out of this car. Some of you guys may remember, given the odd engine bay layout of this thing, that there is no room in front of the engine. It is literally up against the front grille of the car. Space is so tight that we had to remove the front bumper just to get access to the crank nut for our compression test a few episodes ago. And these spatial constraints made me realize that this engine has to come out of the bottom of the car. There's no way it can come out of the top, which means we've got to put it on the lift. The problem is, as you guys probably know, we just pulled the engine out of the Ferrari, and to get the engine out, I had to drop suspension components to remove the axles. So to put the Audi on the lift, we've got to put the suspension on the Ferrari back together and get the Ferrari off the lift. Thankfully, the extent of the disassembled suspension is a dropped upper control arm. Reassembly is super straightforward and only took a couple of minutes. This is the small part of the job. It's getting the Ferrari off of the lift that's the actual headache. To do that, we've got to get the wheels and tires reinstalled. The car needs to roll on its own accord so that we can get it out of our way. Getting the car off of the lift arms itself requires the familiar song and dance of using a jack and two by fours, but with a bit of work, it's freed from its perch and we can roll it outside. However, to move the Audi, we're gonna need that dolly that we built a number of episodes back for the Ferrari. The only problem is, the Audi's sitting on jack stands that are way too close together to fit the dolly between. So, we've got an interesting conundrum on our hands. To rectify this, I grabbed a four x four piece of wood and jacked it up underneath the Audi's subframe, and then moved the jack stands to the outside in an effort to give myself more room. This seemed to work up until I realized it was nowhere near high enough to get the dolly underneath it. Thus began another song and dance of trying to get enough ground clearance. Mm -hmm. 
Eventually, with a little bit of help from my friend Khalil, I got it perched atop the dolly and moved over to the lift. But there were still a couple of minor annoyances I was facing down. The problem is there's not really enough room between the bottom of the Audi and the top of the dolly to fit the lift arms. Just like getting the car onto the dolly in the first place, it requires a ton of work to get it perched on the lift arms, but eventually we pulled it off, giving me the opportunity to lift the car into the air for the first time since I bought it. I've mentioned in the past that this car has been restored at one point in its life. Realistically, it's not the best work I've ever seen, but it's certainly not bad. Components like the brakes were replated in a yellow CAD, while the subframes were pulled and completely repowder coated. You just have to ignore all the coolant that's now on them from when the head gasket blew. There's even small touches like solid aluminum subframe bushings both front and rear, and it's really clear that someone really cared about this car at one point in time. Honestly, my only complaint is that it's clear somebody's jacked this car up from the pinch welds. It's not a huge deal, but it's definitely a bummer. With the car up in the air, we can focus on the work underneath it that needs to be complete in order to get the engine out. So I dropped the exhaust and then turned my attention to the drive shaft. Because this car has been disassembled at least once in its life, none of the hardware was seized and everything came out pretty easily although I did come close to absolutely crushing my fingers in the U-joint. To further support my conclusion that the engine has to come out of the bottom of the car, it's obvious from this angle that the engine mounts are actually suspended from the top, completely atypical from anything else I've ever seen. But honestly, I kind of dig it. With these unbolted, along with a few other things I knocked out off camera, the engine's just about ready to come out. So I think I'm ready to unbolt the subframe from the car, engine's ready to come down, except for one thing, and that's the shift linkage on top of the transmission. It's like one shaft slipped into another that's then clamped down. And I have that bolt out so it should come apart, except at some point in this car's history, some bastard welded this thing together on the car. It might be kind of tough to see, but there is a tack weld holding the two pieces together. And without a way to get in there and cut just that tack weld, I've taped off the end of the transmission so I don't get any medical particles inside of it, and I'm gonna cut the shift linkage itself. Honestly, I hate having to cut something to pull an engine. It's definitely not the right way to do it, but the shift assembly won't drop down, and I don't even know if we're gonna reuse it. And last but not least, I've got a welder. I can fix this if I need to. So I used the Sawzaw to solve the problem. With the shift linkage cut into two parts, the engine is more or less ready to drop. Everything else we'll find on the engine's way out. Out of curiosity, it was right around this time that Byron and Khalil from next door at Lightbow stopped by to see how progress was going. And honestly, it was perfect timing because I definitely don't mind having a few extra hands and extra eyeballs as this engine comes out. With a dolly underneath the engine and transmission to support it, we should be good to go. Well, except... Have we talked about how there's no room in the front of this car yet? There was a sort of isolator or engine centering mount on the front of the motor, which was butted up against the core support, and at the time I thought it was keeping us from dropping the engine. And then of course, there was the brake pressure accumulator that was mounted to the side of the motor that kept us from moving it far enough over to clear the turbo from the right side engine mount. And then there was an AC line keeping us from moving the engine over far enough to clear everything else. There we go. Eventually though, we found the clearance that we needed and all that was left was the remnants of a clutch line I had cut. Hey, I know I said I don't like cutting things, but this clutch line was gonna get replaced no matter what. I just didn't make it all the way through. <laughs> Yeah, it looks clear.
That Sorry is uh, for the, like 15 things you missed. That went pretty easy. Better than 16. <laughs> so there you have it. The engine is officially out. As for what its fate will be, I have no idea, but let's take one final look at this thing. As mentioned, it's clear at one point in time somebody really cared about this engine and obviously invested a ton of money into it. Most of it is new. Details like all of the work that went into the intake manifold really make this motor shine, but what was cool to find was what lurked underneath it. An equally pretty, period correct, cast Dialynx turbo manifold. All sorts of little details began to show once I was able to actually see this engine, such as the AN fittings mounted to the turbo for increased flow, or the hand polished power steering and brake pump mounted to the top of the motor that I had completely overlooked previously. The only surprising find was the hogged out solid engine mount, but once I looked at the chassis side I realized somebody has been in here and repaired the threads. I don't know if I'll leave it, but I'm not upset about it. Past that, the engine bay is in really nice shape. It's admittedly disgusting, especially on the driver's side, but there's no rust to be found and all the sheet metal is really solid. I think we've got some really good bones to work with. With the engine out though, there's one thing I wanna talk about because honestly, I think it's kind of insane. I don't know what Audi was thinking when they designed the steering rack setup for this car. The steering rack in the Quattro is actually mounted behind the engine and above the transmission. And I know this is the result of odd packaging constraints due to the drivetrain in this thing, but it's still weird, really weird. Frankly, it's also the biggest reason we're not going to put some other foreign power plant into this car. It would be a complete headache. The tie rods extend from the center of the car, through the fender liners, and out into the wheel wells themselves. The hole through which they pass is tall so that the suspension can still cycle, which is equally odd. And then there's the fact that the toe is only adjusted on one side. I have to imagine you set the passenger side of the car straight, and then dial in the driver's side to get it to track correctly. Overall, it makes sense, and I understand why they did it, but I wanted to talk about it because it's still unlike any other car I've seen personally. So I'm recording this outro, and I have just realized the stabilization on the camera has been turned off maybe this entire time. I have no idea. I'll, I'm reminding myself later to put a note about that earlier in the video. None of that makes any sense. Anyways, I'm excited. Engine's out, engine bay looks good. I'm really pumped to get the new engine on a stand and torn down. So in the next couple weeks, we're gonna take it next door to see these boys at Like Bow, the guys who are here helping me pull the engine. We're gonna tear the motor down, I'm gonna help. We're gonna go through and start one really cool, high-powered AAN build. It's gonna make this car amazing. I'm so excited for this. This build's gonna be sweet. I'm pumped. It's such a departure from the Ferrari. It's a breath of fresh air. How cool is it to have both of these going at the same time? It's gonna be sweet. Anyways, enough rambling. That's enough for this episode. I've done plenty of talking. I'm gonna head into the office and start editing. I'll catch you guys next week. Thanks as always for the support.